Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining me today for this presentation, once again, as part of the Gray Learning webinar series, where today I'll be talking about some of my favorite tips as it relates to travel photography. Now, of course, I totally understand right now this might seem like a little bit of an odd topic. Normally, I would be traveling all over the place right now. I had plans to travel quite extensively this year for about nine or ten months out of the year. And of course, that travel is not happening. So it might seem odd to talk about travel photography when most of us are not really able to travel, at least not very far. But it is still a topic that I've gotten a lot of questions about. It's a popular topic, certainly. And if you, like me, enjoy traveling, then of course, a lot of your photography might involve travel. And so I want to talk about some of the tips that will help you capture better travel photos, even if that just means traveling close to home in the near term, and then of course, especially in the longer term as you continue traveling all over the place. Before we do jump in, I want to give another thanks to Tamron for sponsoring the Gray Learning webinar series for making today's presentation possible. So thank you very much to Tamron. And thank you for joining me for this presentation. I do want to mention if you've got questions along the way or if there's a tip that I missed, a suggestion that you have, feel free to share those. Over on the right side of the webinar platform here, you'll find a button with a question mark and a thought bubble there. You can click on that to expand the right panel and down at the bottom there, you'll see the field where you can submit a question or a comment along the way and I'll be happy to address as many of those as I possibly can. But let's go ahead now and get started with my top tips for travel photography. And I guess the first question really is, what is travel photography? And you know, it's sort of funny to me because here, for example, a photo from Seattle, of course, I'm sure most of you recognize this uh, somewhat iconic subject. And if I go to Seattle today, then taking a picture like this might count as travel photography. But when I lived in the Seattle area, somehow that wouldn't qualify as travel photography. Or visiting New York versus living in New York City is one travel photography and the other not. The other would be street photography, for example, or local photography. And so what really is travel photography? Well, to me, travel photography is photography that provides a sense of place. It provides some sense of what it's like to be in a particular place or to have an experience related to a particular place. And of course, it can relate to small details. So here, for example, I'll bet you know where this photograph was captured. Yes, of course an iconic scene from London, and yet this doesn't really include a lot of information. This photo doesn't really convey exactly where we are because it's a tighter shot. I decided to essentially just crop the scene, and so I've cut off part of the bus, I've cut off most of the building, so it doesn't necessarily tell you where this is, except even though I'm missing a lot of detail, you might say, in this photo, if you're at all familiar with London, especially, of course, the red double-decker buses, then you immediately know exactly where this is. And so, of course, conveying some sense of the place, the experience, the people, the culture, whatever it might be, that conveys a feeling, some sense of what it was like to be there, to have those experiences. And, of course, if that travel for your travel photography involves traveling to another country, one of the things that I very strongly recommend is that you learn the local language. Well, okay, not necessarily learn the local language, but learn a little bit of the local language, at least to make an effort, at least a bare minimum. And one of the top things that I recommend when you're going to visit a country where you don't speak the language, or at least it's not your native tongue, even if you're not good with foreign languages, at a minimum, learn how to ask, do you speak English in the local language? So this photo, for example, was captured in Bavaria, in Germany. And so before going to Germany, I would want to at least learn 
Sprechen Sie Englisch. I want to at least know how to ask them if they speak English in the local language, which might seem a little bit silly, because if they speak English, they'll understand when you say, do you speak English? But the reason I recommend learning how to ask this question, well, do you speak whichever language it is that you need them to be able to speak, but the reason I recommend asking in the local language is because it demonstrates that you're making an effort that you're not just showing up with absolutely no effort and no knowledge. You're actually trying to essentially fit in, as it were, when it comes to the locals and visiting a foreign country. And of course, uh, going beyond that, if you can pick up a few additional little tips, so uh, traveling to Italy, for example, um, dove il bagno? Where is the bathroom? That can be an important one to be able to ask and to get a quick answer. Uh, but also, if you're going to include people or private property, if you want to photograph a shopkeeper's storefront, for example, learn how to ask if you can take a photo. So in Italy, posso fare una foto? If we can learn just a little bit, even if you've got to have a little cheat sheet, a little notepad that you break out so that you can demonstrate that you're making some degree of an effort to actually learn that local language, that I think will serve you very, very well. And it can be fun at the same time. But taking that a step further, one of the most powerful and amazing tools for getting by in a foreign country is Google Translate. Now, the full features here do require that you have an internet connection. So if you're traveling internationally, you would need Wi-Fi access or to get a SIM card for your phone or to activate international data plan for your cell phone. But Google Translate is absolutely amazing. And I just want to demonstrate briefly the core feature here. So of course, we have the ability to be able to type in text. So you can see here, English to Italian, for example. And so I could type in a sentence. It would translate to, in this case, Italian. Of course, you can choose the language and you can choose which direction from English to Italian or vice versa. And you can also then, of course, show the other person the translated text. You can essentially treat it as a dictionary type of word and it'll give you that individual word. But one of the best features is this option called conversation. And so you'll see here within the interface, this happens to be the iPhone version, but the same Google Translate, of course, is available for Android smartphones. It's actually available in your web browser as well. But with the conversation feature, I'll go ahead and tap that option, I can translate between English and Italian. So I'll switch here. And then we can tap a microphone. So, of course, now it's trying to translate, but I'm going to switch to Italian. Posso, f oh, hold on. There we go. Posso avere qualcosa da mangiare? Can I have something to eat? And so you'll see that not only did it take my words that I spoke and automatically figure out what I was saying, in Italian in this case, it then translates the words, of course, to English, shows you the words, but also speaks the words. And so you can have a conversation back and forth between two different languages. So if you tap the other, so I'll tap the English microphone, for example. Yes, what would you like? Cosa vorresti? Vorrei un panino con prosciutto e formaggio. I'd like a ham and cheese sandwich. So if nothing else, I would say that having that ability to essentially let your smartphone do the translating for you, it's like having your own personal interpreter. It is absolutely amazing and can work very, very nice. I find that it, for international travel, it obviously can be tremendously helpful and make you feel a lot more comfortable which obviously can be helpful as well. In addition to getting some sense of the local language, I also really encourage you to learn something about the local culture. I, I suppose actually this would be true not just for international travel, but traveling to a different region of your own country so that you can make sure that you're fitting in, that you kind of know the local customs. So for example, the first time that I visited Japan, 
I did some reading. And in particular, what I was trying to make sure I was learning was behavior, making sure I wasn't going to embarrass myself or offend anyone. So, for example, it's considered generally offensive if you stick your chopsticks into the rice versus setting them aside on the table. And so just knowing some of the, the little nuances of behavior and the culture in general it can make for a better travel experience, but also a much better uh, experience in terms of the interactions with the locals and just having that sense of sort of fitting in, that you're not an outsider looking in, that you're actually getting inside of the culture to some extent. Also, of course, before we get to a destination, to pack wisely. And this really holds true regardless of where you're going. I know sometimes when I go on a road trip, I feel like, oh, I've got the car, I've got a trunk, I can fill it up with every piece of photo gear I can imagine, except then I pull over and want to take a great photo, but I can't find the particular item that I need because there's so much stuff there, it just gets lost in the shuffle. And so the way I try to think about this is, number one, what do I need? trying to anticipate in advance the photo opportunities that you might have available to you. But also, what do you not need? Another way to think of this is what will you end up wishing that you had? Or what will you wish that you hadn't brought along, that you didn't carry, that it was not worth the wait? And for me personally, this is just my approach, but I usually try to pack as light as possible so that I can be very nimble. So you see this very slimline backpack that actually is a camera bag. There's the pouch up at the top for the camera and there's a back access point for ad accessing various lenses as well as some side pockets. And so this is my preferred way of traveling. This is part of the reason I think a lot of photographers have gone mirrorless is so that they can have a smaller, lighter package available to them so that they can get around a little bit more easily. And so, for example, I know some of you have joined me for previous webinar presentations where I've talked about a lens that I've been using a lot lately, a Tamron 18 to 400 millimeter zoom lens, this all-in-one zoom. And certainly, when you've got a zoom lens that covers an extensive range, then obviously there will be some degree of compromise. So it won't necessarily be as sharp as a prime lens, for example. And so there might be some compromises, but the convenience can be really great. And this lens, for example, that I've been using, I've been getting great results with it, and I don't have to change lenses. And so I don't have to worry about getting dust on the sensor as much as I might otherwise because I'm not changing lenses or very rarely changing lenses. So being able to get by with just a single lens and having this tremendous range. So this is a photo of me with the 18 to 400 at a waterfall and uh, this was in uh, Mauritius, actually. And so capturing a variety of different interpretations, if you will, of that waterfall. And so here's a shot captured at 53 millimeters, for example. And then the same waterfall, just zooming in to 177 millimeters, in part because the mist was forming that rainbow that you see at the bottom center of the image. And so being able to capture different variations on the same subject. And this is 177, 177 millimeters, whereas the lens goes all the way out to 400. So I still had more room to go. And in fact, I did. So this goes out to 355 millimeters in this particular case, getting a closer look at just that cascading water in that area where the rainbow was showing up from the mist. And so again, just having more utility, having a little bit more flexibility where you can take advantage of photographic opportunities on the fly and not have to you know, switch lenses or open up your backpack and track down lenses, et cetera, or other gear. So trying to be as nimble as possible. And then, of course, when it comes to other gear, Naturally, a topic that comes up a lot is tripods. And uh, if you've heard me talk before, then you probably know that I generally try not to use a tripod. Well, okay, I don't try not to use a tripod, but I generally don't use a tripod unless I really need it. So for me, usually, I prefer to capture everything handheld 
unless I need a tripod, so for a long exposure, for example. But otherwise, if I can go handheld, so much the better in my mind. Yes, of course, there's the risk of softer images because I'm not as stable as a tripod, but also not using a tripod gives me a little more flexibility. And so, you know, for landscape photography at sunrise, I'm gonna break out the tripod, but for travel photography, when I'm maybe exploring around a city or town or countryside, and I wanna be a little bit more nimble, I want to be able to switch from one subject, subject to another a little bit more quickly. And so I generally don't use a tripod. When I need a tripod, well, that depends. I do use a tripod that will fit into my luggage so that I can pack it and have it if I need it, but also a smaller travel tripod. In many cases, a small travel tripod or a beanbag will work just great. And of course, if it's a travel, a little mini tripod, it might not be as stable or it might be a lot shorter. Now you've got to try to find something to put the tripod on, but it's a matter of making those decisions. And I know some photographers use a tripod for every single photo, no matter what, and that's totally great, but you also then don't have quite as much flexibility. So thinking about the types of photos you're capturing and whether or not that tripod is really super critical. I see there was a question from John here about what that backpack was. So the backpack in question, this is from Low Pro, and it is their Pro Tactic BP 350 AW2. So that's a, that's a mouthful, but it's a nice streamlined backpack, and I found that it works pretty well in terms of having a smaller package, essentially, having a smaller bag to carry with me. I prefer to use a backpack because it's just easier to carry around, I find, at least for me personally, but I do like, and of course, I, there are other bags that I use when I need more gear, when I'm bringing along a lot more stuff, but in general, I would say that I'm trying usually to travel as light as possible. I see Sherry's question also about the camera. So notice, yes, I'm still using a digital SLR. That happens to be the Canon 7D Mark II is the camera that I'm using primarily right now. Uh, I've not yet gone to mirrorless. I know so many photographers have, but I have not yet done that myself. Maybe someday soon, perhaps. All right, and then of course, when it comes to the subjects, that you're going to photograph or the opportunities that you might have researching what sorts of events might be available in a variety of different areas. And so photogenic events. So here, of course, probably familiar to many of you, maybe some of you have had the opportunity, the amazing opportunity to visit is the Albuquerque Balloon Fiesta. But I find, you know, I sort of used to not think about events in general. And so I wouldn't, you know, research events specifically. I wouldn't plan to go to events. And then I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to speak at an event in Albuquerque, New Mexico, that was fortunately scheduled to coincide with the Albuquerque Balloon Fiesta. And it was absolutely amazing. So now I'm a big advocate for <laughs> finding out what sort of events are out there, you know, whether it's just something that interests you personally, or if it is an event that would be especially photogenic, such as the Balloon Fiesta, but just maintaining more of an awareness of kind of what's going on out there. Uh, for example, I think what the first time I vi visited Siena in Italy, I had no idea about the horse race there. <laughs> you know, there have been so many situations where I learned about essentially two things I knew about, an event and a location, but somehow I'd never tied the two together. And so doing a little bit of research, either in terms of figuring out where you want to go based on those events, or what opportunities you might have. So what events are going to be happening in a local community, for example, that you're going to be visiting. I see Kathy's question about that 18 to 400 millimeter lens that I had mentioned as one of my go-to lenses when I'm traveling. Uh, she's asking what the speed is. How fast is that lens? Uh, so the lens aperture, I assume, is what you're referring to there, is f3.5 to f6.3, of course, depending on the focal length. And so I found that that is, it provides great performance in terms of autofocus uh, and, of course, still being able to get some relatively narrow depth of field 
depending on what's going on. So it, that's, as I mentioned, become my go-to lens. Obviously, it's not necessarily the right pick for every single photographer, depending on what you tend to photograph. But for me, I do tend to take advantage of zoom. I love having a lot of reach. I know some of you have heard me talk about the 150 to 600 millimeter lens that I've also used connected to that 7D Mark II that I mentioned, which has a 1.6x cropping factor, and I've got tremendous reach. And so I really do like to use a longer lens uh, in many cases, so I like having that additional flexibility. All right, another tip when it comes to traveling. So obviously there's some research you can do in advance to find out about what's going to be going on, but there are also opportunities once you get to a destination to engage with the locals. And so, for example, this is a shot that is from the, many of you might recognize, the Palouse region of eastern Washington state. I've been visiting there every year now for the last 10 years. This is the first year that I've not been able to lead photo workshops there, obviously, due to the, the current situation, but an absolutely wonderful place to visit. And so, Naturally, part of the draw is the rolling hills, the beautiful landscape, but then engaging with the locals. So having spent a lot of time over the years in this region, we get to know people. We visit the town of Palouse. So Palouse is the name of the region. It's also the name of a town in the area. So the town of Palouse, we visited a coffee shop, start chatting with some of the locals, and they ask if I've seen the ghost sign. And I had no idea what in the world they were talking about. It was just across the street. Well, I didn't know about it because the only reason it was visible is that unfortunately a building had burned down, but it revealed the wall of the adjacent building where this advertising sign had been painted. So since it was hidden for so long and appeared out of nowhere, they dubbed it the ghost sign, which all by itself was fun to photograph. And so just by talking with someone in a local coffee shop and getting some tips, those tips don't always pan out. The locals don't necessarily have a sense of what's going to be photogenic and what will not be quite so photogenic, but always good to listen and see for yourself maybe to explore whether or not that possibility might exist in terms of some great photos. Well, then while photographing this ghost sign, another opportunity arose. There were a couple of women who were planting flowers in the empty plot there, the field essentially, I guess you could say, where the building had been torn down after it burned down, and they were trying to beautify the area just a little bit. And one of the women says, well, if you like photographing flowers, because by that point we had started photographing the flowers that they were planting as well, she suggested that we should visit the other woman's garden. And the woman said, yes, you should come on by. And so later in the week, actually, when it was overcast and it was starting to rain just a little bit, we thought, well, Here's a good opportunity to make the most of the, the weather. Let's go photograph a garden and maybe get some flowers with raindrops. So we visited Judy's garden, which was an absolutely stunningly beautiful garden and took advantage of the many different flowers that were available. This was one of my favorite photos that I captured there of an oriental poppy with the raindrops still lingering on the petals and on the stem and just a wonderful, wonderful experience, both in terms of just the enjoyable experience of engaging with those locals, chatting with the locals, getting to know them a little bit better, but then also being able to capture some photographs along the way to get some great photo opportunities that we otherwise would have missed out on. And so trying to, you know, become friends, essentially. You know, one of the tips I've often shared when you want to photograph something related to a person, not necessarily the person themselves, maybe just some something related to their work or their hobby, but one of the best things you can do is to take an interest, to ask them about what it is they're doing, and people are generally very happy to share when it's something that they enjoy, a hobby of theirs, for example. And so by engaging with them, chatting with them, getting to know them or their hobby or their work a little bit better, and then ask if you can capture a photo, you're much more likely to have a cooperative subject there to have success photographically. Also along the way, regardless of where you're traveling, I really encourage you to embrace the experience. And what I have found is that the more sort of ingrained into that experience you are, the better your photos are. 
and the better your memories. And for me at least, a big part of why I capture photos in the first place is to preserve memories, to have a visual reminder of some piece of an experience. And in this case, you know, experiences while traveling. And so this photo, I know some of you have heard me tell this story before, but I was in Japan. This was on my first trip to Japan. This was in Tokyo before continuing to Kyoto. And I was photographing in this cemetery and these prayer sticks and trying to be very respectful, having, of course, studied a little bit about the culture. And so doing my best to try to be respectful of my environment. And a woman at a shrine across the way sort of signaled me over and I thought I was going to get in trouble. And I wouldn't even understand she was going to, you know, yell at me. I did made some mistake unknowingly and she was going to yell at me and I wouldn't even understand a word of what she was saying because back then we didn't have Google Translate on a smartphone. But instead, with no English, she was not interested in giving me a hard time. I, I had been respectful. I had, you know, not done anything to offend. And instead, she actually taught me to pray at this Buddhist temple with no language, which actually sort of strengthened that experience. It made it all the more powerful and meaningful because she's just using gestures to try to show me what she meant. And it was just an absolutely incredible experience. And in fact, part of the issue I had then is that the photo didn't seem to match that experience in terms of its overall mood or feeling, but with a little bit of post-processing, adding a strong vignette and a sepia tone effect, a little bit more contrast, then I got something that had that sort of mystery and timelessness that I felt with that experience. So really trying to embrace not just the experience, but the local experience, the local people and the local customs and traditions. Another good tip, I know you've probably heard this one before, but it really is a good one, as much as it might sound a little bit silly, but that is to check postcards. Obviously, you can check online, you can check Instagram and do a Google search for images and all sorts of other research, but just checking local postcards very often will demonstrate some good photographic opportunities. So this, for example, a very popular view of the Seattle skyline from Cary Park in the Queen Anne area and with the Mount Rainier off in the distance on the right side and of course the Space Needle which is one of the key things that tells us this is Seattle. If you go to Seattle you will find this image on countless postcards. Note though that most of the time if you find a postcard of this scene you're more than likely going to see that the Space Needle is intersecting, is overlapping with the tall building just to the right of it. And that's because many photographers try to get over to the right out of the way of the trees or over to the left. You don't have to move very far to get it out of the way of the trees that you might be able to see in the foreground. The problem is then you've got this big intersection with the building, which to me just looks even more awkward. And so being careful, of course, with the composition. So use the postcards to give you some sense of what locations you might want to visit in a particular area and then improve upon those postcards with even better photos and hopefully even better weather conditions. Another thing that I really highly recommend, if at all possible, depending on where you're visiting, where you're traveling, which actually would apply with this photo of Seattle, but in general, is to seek out elevated viewpoints. Try to get up above sort of the hustle and bustle of the city or, you know, the chaos of the streets or even just above the landscape so that you're above the tree line, for example, rather than in the middle of the trees. And so trying to get a little bit of an elevated viewpoint so that you've got a more almost sort of tranquil, regardless of where you are and what you're photographing, you get this a little bit more tranquil sort of bird's eye view of an area that can work out very, very nicely. This is Rome, Italy, of course, as is this. From a couple of different vantage points, uh, there are, of course, some hills around Rome so that you can get elevated on the outskirts of the central area of Rome. But also here from the rooftop of the Castel Sant'Angelo, uh, which provides a really nice view into the heart of Rome here, especially in late afternoon light, as you see here. 
And so anytime you can get just a little bit more elevated, find a rooftop or a hilltop or you know whatever opportunities you can find. I've been known to climb up on top of a van when uh, <laughs> there's nothing else to climb on top of in order to get a little bit more elevated view of the surrounding terrain, as the case may be. I think it's also important to consider sort of the mood of the place you're in. Uh, so for example, this photo was captured in Bratislava, Slovakia, and in you know the central part of town, the old town, and it just had this sort of gritty feeling, which I don't mean it in a negative way. It just felt like there were so many textures and you know there was some graffiti here and there, and things were a little bit weathered. Uh, you could see the trolley car here, for example, a little bit dinged up here and there, and you know the stucco is peeling in places on the building in the background. The, drain pipe is dented up a little bit. And so I tried to find scenes in particular that conveyed, in this case, that grittiness, that texture of the city. And in post-processing in this particular case, I attempted to emphasize that grittiness with some effects. But trying to find ways to match the photo to the mood. And so, for example, that prayer sticks photo from Tokyo where I added a, a vignette effect and the sepia tone to try to get the photo to match the mood of my experience or the mood of the place itself. And so both in terms of seeking out subjects and finding ways to interpret the scene, but also the way you process the photos a little bit later. Also, one thing I find, you know, I, I feel like every photographer likes to joke about this, when they're traveling and they see other people getting ready for Instagram, photographing their food, photographing their desserts. But actually, in many cases, of course, the food can be a big part of the travel experience. Well, for me, food's a big part of everyday experience. But when we're traveling, especially, we might have the opportunity to try foods that we've not had before or try foods that are prepared in unique and interesting ways. And so certainly, I guess that now we've started to shift into food photography, but that's one of the great things about travel photography is that it doesn't really encompass just one type of photography. It can encompass essentially every type of photography all in one fell swoop. So really what makes it travel photography is trying to relate what it was like to be there. And obviously the food in many cases will be a memorable part, I hope, of what it was like to be in a particular place. And so I say, go at it with gusto. Don't try to sneak in a quick photo, but actually take a moment. Don't let your food get cold, but take a moment to capture a nice photo of any of the food you have an opportunity to enjoy that happens to also be nice and photogenic. And also keep an eye out for unique scenes. And, you know, this can mean a wide variety of different things, but anything that catches your eye as being unique to a particular place or unusual compared to what you're used to might make for a fun photo opportunity. So this little scene caught my eye and I had to chuckle because this is on the tiny little atoll of Fanning Island in the island nation of Kiribati in the Pacific. There are only about 2,000 people on this island and yet you've got these police. Now, of course, the police don't appear to be too terribly busy. It seems like they're just taking a break, enjoying their beautiful water view here. But it, I just found it so amusing that you know a peaceful, tranquil, tiny little island like this even needed the police in the first place. Uh, but then, of course, the fact that they were just hanging out there, relaxing, seemed fitting. So you know, anything that sort of catches your eye as being something that you're not really used to, or that is uh, humorous or funny or just you know different can make for a real nice photographic opportunity. And in addition to unique scenes, try to seek out unique opportunities, unique experiences that you can document photographically. So, you know, funny enough, I grew up in Southern California and in the summertime, I would go surfing in the Pacific Ocean. And whenever I was sitting there on the board waiting for a wave, I was constantly scared thinking a great white shark was going to come grab me at any moment. And yet when I visited Bora Bora, I couldn't wait to go swimming with the black tip reef sharks out in the ocean, just in the water all by yourself. This is not with my digital SLR, by the way. In this case, I just brought a cheap little underwater camera so that I didn't need to worry about my SLR in a, an underwater housing, for example. 
but certainly a memorable experience. It was tremendously fun, and I'm so happy to have some photos, even though they're not the best quality photos because it's just a cheap little point-and-shoot underwater camera, but some photos to remember that experience of swimming with those sharks in Bora Bora. Obviously, you don't need to go swimming with sharks to have an adventure, to have a unique experience, but whatever unique experiences you do have, be sure to document them. Now, I think it's also important to keep in mind, be sure from time to time to set that camera aside so that you don't miss out on anything, but also, as photographers, I think it's fair to say, you don't want to miss out on having a photograph to document that experience, to basically preserve that memory and hopefully have a wonderful photo that's worthy of hanging on the wall as well. That's not the case with these shark photos, certainly, but it was a fun experience nevertheless, and I'm certainly happy to have the photos from that experience. Another issue I find, and especially I feel like if you've traveled a long distance, to take your time with composition. So I had the very wonderful opportunity a couple of years ago to visit Easter Island in the Pacific, of course, in the South Pacific. And I suspect I may never have the opportunity to visit Easter Island again. I would certainly welcome the opportunity, but I'm not sure that I necessarily will. And it's a long way from everything. Getting to Easter Island requires a little bit of time. And so I wanted to make sure that I captured an image that I would be happy with. It was hot. I was ready to get back to air conditioning, but I took some time to try to make sure that I was getting a photo that I would be happy with. You certainly do not want to get home wishing that you had captured the scene in a different way. So when in doubt, capture more photos. I captured so many images of these Moai statues in Easter Island in all sorts of different ways, different perspectives, different angles. And so I came away with a, a photo that I was happy with. But just try to make sure that you're taking that time with composition to carefully think through what is going to be the best interpretation of that scene. And again, in this case, when I've traveled far and I want to make sure that I don't mess up my opportunity that I might not ever have again. But in any scenario, of course, if you can take the time with composition just to make sure that you get that shot that you're looking for. And also watch for juxtapositions. Now, I mentioned in the case of the Space Needle in Seattle, that intersection, that awkward juxtaposition potentially, but there can be great juxtapositions as well. This is a popular scene from the Dumbo neighborhood of Brooklyn. This is the Manhattan Bridge. And of course, in the background, in the heart of New York City, we've got the Empire State Building and you can position that Empire State Building so that it appears in the frame of the tower of the bridge. And so anytime you can juxtapose different elements, and especially in the context of travel photography, if you're juxtaposing elements that give you a better sense of where this is, then all the better. And so trying to keep an eye on you know, how different subjects relate to each other in terms of their position, and can you move into a different position to get the relative positions of the objects within the scene that you're photographing to come together in a more interesting way. And I think also it's worth mentioning, you know, finding the right angle sometimes takes a little bit of effort. It can be really challenging sometimes. You find a location. This is Hallstatt in the middle of the Alps in Austria. And of course, the Alps are absolutely beautiful and the little town of Hallstatt is just so incredibly charming. It's right on the lake with the mountains rising up. They seem to just go straight up. Wonderful. And the first time I visited Hallstatt, walking through town, it was so incredibly charming, but I felt that I wasn't getting any photos that really stood out. Fortunately, I spotted little electric motorboats on the water and realized that they were available for rent. And so I got one of those boats and was able to get out onto the water. And I was struck by the reflections on the lake. And so I found a position where I could photograph the town with the mountains in the background, with the reflections on the water in the foreground, and got a photo that I was very happy with. After all this frustration of feeling that I wasn't getting the right photo, that I wasn't really sort of capturing what it felt like to be in this really cute, quaint town in this stunningly beautiful landscape, but getting out, in this case, onto the water. So 
trying to think about what your possibilities might be, what your options might be, and then seeing what you can do to make those possibilities a reality so that you can get a good angle on the scene or the subject that you're photographing. And to some extent, when it's possible or when it makes sense for the subject, trying to find unique angles. And so, you know, if you're in the forest, you might take a photo looking straight up at the trees with a wide angle lens. This happens to be in San Juan, Puerto Rico. There were these colorful umbrellas suspended over the street, and it was really a fun scene. So in this case, I captured a panorama. This was not very easy. I tried to make it easier on myself by using a smartphone to pan across and capture the panorama, but I, it went from street to street, so nearly 180 degrees, and having to pan across, you know, from one side to the other going straight up in between. It was challenging, but it's a fun photo that reminds me of the fun time walking down this street with all these colorful umbrellas overhead. I'll rotate this image here so you can get a little bit larger view and see that it really does encompass. It's not perfect, it's not straight, but it took me a lot of tries just to get this one and my back was starting to ache, so I decided that this was good enough for uh, what is essentially really just a sort of memory snapshot to remind me of an experience. But whenever you can find an interesting, unique, eye-catching angle, so much the better, I think, uh, with your travel photography to make those photos a little bit more captivating. I talked about researching in terms of using different tools for planning, researching photo opportunities and events, for example, but it can also be helpful to plan for the sun and the moon. And so one of the tools that I use for this purpose is called the Photographer's Ephemeris. It's available for Android and iPhone smartphones. It's also available in a web browser. I created a course, by the way, the link that you see here, timgray.me slash sun moon, will take you to the Gray Learning website where you can learn about the course that I created on the Photographer's Ephemeris. But the Photographer's Ephemeris allows you to plan for when events will occur. So for example, when will there be a full moon? When will the sunrise or sunset be? When will there be an eclipse, for example? But also it enables you to plan. So knowing that there's going to be a full moon, for example, on a particular date, uh, in this case in 2017 in Rome, I knew I was going to be there during a full moon. And in fact, this was when I was leading a photo workshop in Rome. And so I wanted to hopefully provide the opportunity for my workshop participants to be able to photograph the full moon over Rome. And so we planned out and I looked at, you know, I wanted an elevated position if at all possible. And so looking at the map within the photographer's ephemeris, looking at the particular date when we planned to capture the full moon if the weather cooperated, and then seeing from different vantage points. You can place this red push pin onto the map and you'll see lines indicating where the moon or the sun, as the case may be, will be relative to your position, relative to that red push pin, at sunrise, sunset, moonrise, moonset. And so with a little bit of advanced planning, I was able to take my group up to a hilltop, up, up looking over the heart of Rome, and to capture images as the full moon rose over the hills in the background. So just a little bit of advanced planning with a help from various tools, in this case the photographer's ephemeris, in order to make photos like this possible. And not only for planning the actual shot, but perhaps equally important or even more important is actually knowing that that opportunity existed. I don't imagine most of us go through our days knowing when the next full moon is going to be, unless you do a lot of night photography, for example. And so just making a, an effort to seek out some of these possible opportunities. Will there happen to be a full moon? Of course, will the weather cooperate, etc. And then also tracking locations. And this can take on a variety of different forms, but I can't tell you how many times I photographed a place and then later wished that I had known where that was or what that was. So uh, here, for example, this is just a church in the city of Graz in Austria. And if you just photograph the church, you might not have any recollection whatsoever of which church this was or which plaza this was in. And so a simple solution is to photograph the sign. So this is Maria Hilfer Kirche. 
Uh, I'm probably not pronouncing that anywhere near accurately. My German pronunciation is terrible. But by being able to photograph a sign either right before or right after you photographed a subject, so now you've got that photo right alongside the photo of the subject so that you can remind yourself of what that subject was. Another option is to capture what I refer to as a location snapshot. And so here is a photo of me capturing a photo from atop the Alps. This is a location called the Five Fingers because they have these platforms that extend out so that if you're afraid of heights, you're not going to be very comfortable there, but you can get out there and have these unencumbered views of the surrounding landscape. It happens to be near the town of Hallstatt that I showed you with a photo earlier. But by capturing a photo with a camera, in this case a smartphone, that includes a GPS receiver, now you know the location of that photo, so that even if you're using a camera that does not include a GPS receiver, you could correlate the two. So I've got my location snapshot from a smartphone, and then I have my photo from an SLR, for example, that does not have built-in GPS, and I can correlate the two to figure out what the location actually was. You can also record a track log. So you could use a GPS device or a smartphone, for example, to record a track log that essentially records your travel. So as you're wandering around a town, it records where you are at different intervals, so maybe every 15 seconds, for example, depending on which app you're using, and then you're capturing photos along the way. Well, the track log knows where you are at any given time, as long as you're recording a track log during that time, and then the camera knows what time you took the picture. So both of those, the track log has your location plus the time, and your camera has the photos plus the time, and so software such as Lightroom can match up those times so that your photos can then be plotted on the map. I see Renato is asking a question, have you tried PhotoPills? Yes, and actually PhotoPills offers some additional opportunities in terms of research features. So PhotoPills, it's like photo, of course, and pills, like taking your medication, put those two together, that's PhotoPills. Uh, it's a great app. In fact, I'm working on a video course on PhotoPills right now, and that'll be available soon as well. So that is a good tool in addition to the photographer's ephemeris. Of course, another opportunity, another option, and especially if you're looking for an excuse to buy a new camera. I imagine everybody perked up at that, right? <laughs> if you're looking for an opportunity or an excuse to buy a new camera, getting a camera that includes a built-in GPS receiver can make your job a whole lot easier when it comes to remembering where you were. Because if you've got that GPS enabled on your camera, then your camera is automatically adding location information to your photos as they're being captured. So that here, for example, this is the map in Lightroom Classic. And so I can have all of these photos appear on the map on automatically in the location where they were captured. And they show up on the map automatically simply because I was using a camera that has a built-in GPS receiver. And so to me, this is a critical feature. It's something that I thought was nice to have when I first got a camera with a built-in GPS receiver. Now I consider it perhaps more important even than the lens. Uh, well, okay, not really. But it, to me, is such an invaluable feature in terms of travel photography. So if you like to travel with your camera, then I strongly suggest considering a camera that has a built-in GPS receiver. As you're traveling, of course, be aware of your surroundings. This hopefully goes without saying, but it's a good tip nevertheless. Uh, this scene of the Colosseum in Rome, for example, I consider Rome to be a very safe city, but at this particular location, for whatever reason, there are very often pickpockets. And so you've got to keep an eye on things, maintain an awareness of what's going on around you. But that goes beyond just for your own safety, but also your surroundings in terms of photo opportunities. So I found this cute little lake in Bavaria in southern Germany and so went out there at sunrise and it was a great scene, I thought, for a sunrise photo, a sunrise landscape. But then as you explore around the lake, there's all sorts of other photographic opportunities. There are these large boulders that have some trees and other plants growing on them, for example, and those are interesting, especially in the early morning light with reflections on the water, going around to the other side of the water with a little bit of that steam fog showing up on the surface of the lake and photographing with the reflections. 
so many opportunities. It felt like there was great photography around every corner by exploring, by being aware of what else was in this little area. In this case, fortunately, a small enough lake that you could drive all the way around it. But keeping an awareness of what those photo opportunities are, what might be nearby, worth a little bit of additional exploration. And I think it's also good to keep in mind that we want to try to go beyond the monuments, as it were, the big top attractions. If you go to Rome, of course you're going to visit Vatican City and photograph the Basilica. You're going to photograph the Colosseum, maybe the Spanish Steps and the Trevi Fountain and the Pantheon. But going beyond that, and I find personally that very often my favorite photos from a trip are captured off the beaten path. And so here, for example, this is in the Trastevere neighborhood, one of my favorite neighborhoods to photograph in Rome. A little door hidden around this alleyway back behind one of the piazzas there. And so a little hidden gem, essentially. Or near Campo dei Fiori, which is another great place to visit photographically. But then a couple little side streets away, I found this beautiful door with a nice shadow being cast across it. Wonderful textures. And so try to go beyond the obvious scenes and seek out some of the, those more hidden gems that you might not find as readily, but they can create some great photo opportunities. That said, remember, tourist spots work. Of course, many photographers avoid touristy spots. They, they don't want to visit those areas that are too popular with the tourists. But often those locations are popular because they are impressive and worthy of photographing. Here, the Duomo in Florence, Italy, for example. Another tip, and I find a lot of photographers avoid this, but to take a tour. Well, of course, photographers avoid this, and then I try to convince them to come with me when I lead field photography workshops, which are in some ways a, a guided tour of photography. But visiting Rome, my wife wanted to take a tour in an old vintage Fiat, a Fiat 500. Well, you can see... I'm not extremely tall, but when it comes to the comparison of a Fiat, it's a tiny little vehicle, and that was a little bit of a challenge, but it was great, and we were able to visit areas that, even though we had visited Rome many times before, areas that we weren't familiar with, and subjects, in fact. I found this view. This is through looking through, well, photographing through a keyhole in a door, looking through this arch of plants, of shrubs, and then in the distance, the basilica, a scene that I absolutely love visiting and photographing and that I didn't know about until I took a local tour. Or when I was able to visit Madagascar, I certainly wanted to see lemurs. What are the chances I would have been able to find them on my own? I didn't want to take that chance, so I signed up for a tour that guaranteed that I was going to be able to see and photograph a variety of different types of lemurs, which was a lot of fun as well. I saw there was a question about, you know, vacationing and trying to make the most of photographic opportunities when you don't want to disturb others. So if you're traveling with family or friends and they're not photographers and maybe they're not the most patient when it comes to photography, getting an early start can be a great way to solve that problem and to provide additional opportunities. So this, of course, is the Trevi Fountain in Rome, Italy, and you can see off at the far left in the distance and in the far right in the distance and in the near ground uh, over on the, in the bottom right corner, lots and lots of people. The place is swarming with people. This is just after sunset around blue hour, but if you get there really, really early before sunrise, you avoid, don't, not only do you avoid the crowds, you avoid people. When I've gone to the Trevi Fountain before sunrise, the only people I see there, well, sometimes, of course, police checking to make sure everything's all right, but the only other people I see are photographers, and usually just a couple. Uh, you might see a wedding, some smarter wedding photographers with a couple photographing them in front of the fountain with no other people to get in the way. And, of course, the people who are willing to get up that early because they want to take pictures with no people there, they're also going to be, in my experience, more respectful, giving you the opportunity. You know, we, they're more cooperative, in other words, in terms of getting out of each other's way. And so getting a really early start, getting up before the sun, getting out there so that you can capture images with, number one, not interfering with your schedule, with those you're traveling with, 
uh, not frustrating them that you're taking too long to capture your photos, but also being able to take advantage of popular tourist sites without people there getting in your way. So not too far away. The Pantheon, of course, same thing. Usually the piazza here teeming with people. But if you get there before sunrise, suddenly the piazza is virtually empty. Speaking of people, speaking of places void of people, one of the big topics, I think, in travel photography is whether you should include people or no people in the frame. I would be embarrassed to admit how long I had to wait to get this shot with no people. As soon as people were leaving the frame, it seemed like other people were entering the frame. And so I waited and waited and waited. I'm not sure the photo was necessarily worth the wait, but I got my photo with no people in it by being patient. Of course, you could also use post-processing. You could capture multiple photos of the same scene and then merge those photos together and use various techniques in Photoshop, for example, to remove the people in post-processing so you've got a people-free shot. But sometimes, and certainly I am one who tends to prefer not to have people in my photos, generally speaking. That said, sometimes people in a scene can add context or they can add warmth they can add or take away a sense of sort of a sterile environment. It creates this sense of this is a place that people actually visit, that people actually enjoy. And so here, fishermen out on a lake in a rowboat at sunrise, and the people really sort of make the shot. It would be a very different photo if that were just an empty boat anchored, you know, or, or moored out there in the water. And so sometimes people really do make the shot in terms of Travel. Of course, here you see the people are not identifiable, they're silhouetted, and so I don't even need a model release if I wanted to use that photo in an advertisement, for example. Uh, so here, the story really is about the person. Again, not identifiable. He has his back to us. Uh, this happens to be uh, Lake Retba, and so this is in Africa where they actually get into this very salty water. There's a layer of salt essentially at the bottom of the lake that they scoop out into these baskets. Uh, it's labor intensive. It's certainly got to be very unpleasant work. And so photographing and you know the colors and reflections is all very interesting. So having a person in the shot essentially makes the shot. Uh, same thing here where we've got someone selling uh, little souvenirs essentially, but just wonderful colors and the fact that it's a person with this basket on her head with all these goodies in it essentially makes it a more interesting photo. And of course, these photos, the person has not been identifiable, which is a kind of another way of approaching people photography without having to identify the person without having to necessarily need a model release, release depending on how you're going to use the photo. But then also, with permission, of course, photographing people, and that can also be a great way to capture photographs that convey what it was like to be in a particular location. And, you know, I do hear often tips for from photographers will say, well, just use a long lens and don't let them see that you're photographing them. And I say, engage with the person as best you can. Now, in this case, the there was a group of children, of, of young people, and they only knew, I think, about four words my friend, one dollar, because they were just asking for money. And so, you know, but if you gesture at your camera, uh, they'll usually know they've seen enough tourists to know <laughs> what the camera is and kind of gesture at the camera and get their acknowledgement. And then you might get a, a beautiful smile in the process as well. And so again, sometimes the person makes the photo and sometimes the person contributes to the photo Sometimes you might not want people in the picture. It just depends on the circumstances, but I do encourage you to try to mix it up to some extent. And then when you're photographing these locations, try to think also about what sort of creative possibilities might exist photographically. So here at the Colosseum, and we can blend a long exposure with the street, the lights going by, the street lights getting the sun, uh, starburst effect. And so I mentioned many of you joined me for a previous webinar presentation specifically on long exposure tips. If you point your web browser at timgray.me slash long, that will point you to my Tim Gray TV channel on YouTube where you can view that video to get some long exposure tips. But really, not just long exposure, but 
creative possibilities. What sort of creative techniques can you use in order to capture more captivating photos during your travels? And then finally, start at home. I know we're not able, most of us are not able to do much, if any, travel. If you're traveling at all, it's probably somewhat close to home. But as I mentioned, travel photography doesn't mean you have to go far away. It could be in your own backyard. This was taken right out my window when I saw some daring window cleaners out there hanging from the side of a building. And so practice your travel photography at home, essentially, or close to home, recognizing that great travel photos are really more about conveying a sense of a place and that they, you don't necessarily need to travel far to capture great and fun travel photos. All right, I know we've got some questions here today. First, I do want to say thank you for joining me for this presentation. And thank you again to Tamron for sponsoring the Gray Learning webinar series. As a side note, by the way, I will be leading an online workshop in September in my virtual classroom. You join me for live sessions, get answers to your questions along the way or via email after those sessions. This time, full control in Photoshop, really pushing the limits of using Photoshop to optimize your photographic images. You can learn more about that by pointing your web browser at timgray.me slash full control. In the meantime, I'll try to address as many of the questions here as I can. Uh, so the bus photo, that actually, the question from Antoinette, which lens was used for that bus photo, the bus in London, that actually was that 18 to 400 millimeter lens. It has become over the last, uh, I guess it's been a couple of years since I got it, it's become one of my key go-to lenses for travel when I, especially when I really want to try to travel as light as possible. Uh, John asks about tips for using a cell phone overseas without spending a fortune on data charges. Yeah, the best tip I would say is to get a local prepaid SIM card. And so most phones now, you'll wanna make sure that your phone's not locked to a provider, but most phones, will enable you to swap out the SIM card. And so when I'm traveling internationally, if I'll be in the same region at least for a period of time, then I almost always get a SIM card. It's far less expensive than data charges with your domestic plan when you're traveling abroad. And it also gives you a local phone number. It, I find it to be really, really convenient. Uh, Ronald's asking how large and heavy that 18 uh, to 400 millimeter lens is. I don't know the weight off the top of my hand, uh, off the top of my head, but I can tell you it's not a heavy lens at all. Uh, it's not especially large. Now, of course, when you zoom out, it, stretch, it telescopes out a bit, but it is not a heavy lens. So Ronald mentioned his 100 to 400, that that can be tricky to handhold. Now, I mentioned the 150 to 600 millimeter lens. That is obviously a more substantial lens and not ideal for hand holding. I use it handheld in a variety of situations, but in general, it's better with the tripod. But the 18 to 400, I would say, is one that you really can handhold very comfortably. Uh, so George asked about default exposure settings. So I generally use aperture priority when I'm traveling in large part because I'm often switching from one subject to another somewhat quickly. And so I preferred not to be in manual in that type of situation because there's just more change involved. I want the camera to help me out a little bit when it comes to the exposure. And so, you know, my kind of go-to setting is F8, 400 ISO, and usually with about a minus half stop exposure compensation. And then of course, that works well in most situations when I just need a quick photo, I wanna respond quickly. And then of course I can fine tune as needed. Ah uh, yeah, so Michael's asking about storage on the go. So I actually, because I travel a lot and because I wanna keep my photos safe and backed up, I travel, I happen to use LaCie external hard drives, their rugged line. They have an orange bumper around them and they're bus powered. So you don't need a power adapter. You just need your, uh, your data cable, so like a USB cable. And they're ruggedized, they're rated for dropping. I try to avoid dropping mine, but I like knowing that there's some degree of ruggedness built in. Uh, Gregory's asking what brand of tripod I use. So the uh, the photo that you saw there where I had a tripod in front of me, that is my my go-to tripod, my my sort of, I guess you could say the normal tripod that I use, and that's from Really Right Stuff. I'm a big fan of Really Right Stuff's products. They're designed really well, very rugged, very durable. 
They also have a very small sort of tabletop tripod that works very nicely, include for, including for supporting a digital SLR. Uh, oh, <laughs> so lots of questions about which lens was used for particular photos. Uh, Dick was asking about that Oriental Poppy. That I don't remember right off the top of my head, but I am pretty sure it was a 65 millimeter lens. The key feature there was that it had an f1.8 lens aperture, so I could get some really narrow depth of field. Um, you can follow up with me via email if you want to make sure to get the specific model there as well. Oh, so Bob asks, how often do you use the camera in your cell phone when traveling? Well, that depends. Like many of you who have asked some of the questions, I travel with others and sometimes I need to be sensitive to, you know, not taking up all of the time setting up photos. And so sometimes I might not even bring my quote unquote real camera with me, but I always have my smartphone with me. And so I would say I use the smartphone when I just want to capture a snapshot when I don't have my quote unquote real camera, but I also use it when I just need a casual photo. I don't need a, a photo that I'm going to hang on the wall, I just want to be able to document this above and beyond, and so I do tend to use that in those situations. And also a smartphone, you can capture time-lapse video and slow motion video, so there's some other options that are available there as well. Uh, so Michael's asking about the, uh, the exposure settings for that moonrise over Rome. I don't have that info right here in front of me, and it certainly is not committed to memory. Uh, but one tip, he mentions that he has a tough time getting good moonrise shots. One of the key things that I would remind you of when it comes to the moon is that you need to expose for the moon, first and foremost. And think of the moon. You're photographing the moon perhaps at night or at dusk. But think of it as the moon that you see in the sky is under full sun conditions. It is a sunny day on the moon when you see that moon in the night sky lit up. And so think back to that rule of exposure, sunny 16, except the moonlight reflected back and passing through the atmosphere gets uh, dimmed down a little bit. So instead of sunny 16, think of the variation on that as being full moon 11. So set that lens aperture to f11 and then make the shutter speed quote unquote equal your ISO setting. So about 125th of a second at 100 ISO, for example, at f11. But the key really is not so much about the specific exposure settings, but that you're exposing for the moon itself. Don't let the moon, the moon get blown out because that is usually texture and detail that's important. And obviously, of course, then you either need to photograph while the moon is still low in the sky so that it's being dimmed down a little bit more by the atmosphere, by that thicker atmosphere that you're photographing through kind of sideways as it were. So now that exposure is going to change a little bit, but it means the moon is closer to the exposure of the surrounding terrain. And that also means, of course, that you've got the moon closer. In other words, we want the moon to be reasonably close to our scene, not way up high in the sky with a whole bunch of empty space uh, in between. And so uh, obviously some helpful tips there when it comes to the moon, but it, it can be certainly a little bit tricky and with a little bit of practice, of course, um, that works out very nicely. Uh, so, <laughs> Keith, I'm, 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 I think I'm going to have to do a webinar on which lens I use for which shot. Uh, but Keith's asking about the lens for that food shot and how far away. So that is the same lens as the Oriental Poppy, which again I think was 65 millimeters or somewhere in that range. I'll have to look it up. And with that 1.8 lens aperture, uh, one of those situations where I really wanted to use narrow depth of field to get a more interesting look. And so. At distance would be very, very close, literally sitting at the table and photographing the food that's sitting on the table right in front of me. I uh, see Greg's question here about the track log. So I mentioned using track logs in order to track your location while you're photographing, and then you can map that log up with your actual photos in, for example, Lightroom Classic. And so the app that I'm using these days is called GPS Tracks. Just two words, GPS and tracks, plural. And that enables you to record a log of your location over time. You can import that log into Lightroom Classic, for example, so that you can get that location information uh, semi-automatically. Uh, Dale, good question. Dale's asking if it's possible to manually add GPS coordinates to metadata in Lightroom Classic if you know where the photos were shot. 
Yes, indeed you can. In Lightroom Classic, if you didn't have GPS with you in any of those forms that I talked about at the time the photos were captured, you can actually, in the map module, you can drag and drop photos from the film strip directly onto the map, and that will add those coordinates for that location to the metadata for the image. And I see Carl was asking about computer equipment. So I travel with a laptop. It's actually my primary computer. I don't have a desktop computer since I usually travel so much. And so I have a MacBook Pro as it happens. And I mentioned those LaCie external hard drives. And then, of course, a card reader. And that's about it in terms of the computer here. I usually try to travel, obviously, all the various chargers that I need and the adapters, etc., But I do try to travel pretty light when it comes to that computer gear as well. The key is having the computer to work with and two at least external hard drives in most cases so that I can download photos and so that I can also make a backup of those photos along the way. All right. Oh, and yeah, Ron, good question. So I happen to show, I use Lightroom Classic to manage my photos. I showed a map with all of my push pins from around the globe for my photos and asking if Photoshop Elements has something similar to this. Yes, indeed. In the organizer in Photoshop Elements, you also have a map feature where you can either see photos on the map if they were already captured with GPS embedded with a camera that's equipped with a GPS receiver, for example, or you can add the photos to the map in much the same way as you can in Lightroom Classic. Yeah, and Lee asks, as far as equipment, what do you recommend as far as redundancy for backup? How much is too much? Well, in terms of backup redundancy, I, there's no such thing as too much, except when it comes to carrying that gear, obviously, there is such a thing. And so I use those two external hard drives and back them both up. Of course, obviously, I'm traveling with both, so if I, there's the risk of losing both at the same time. But you could use, if you've got a decent internet connection along the way, you could upload some of your best photos or back up your best photos online. Another consideration would be also, in addition to backing up with external hard drives, is to bring along some extra media cards so that you don't need to actually format the media card. You don't need to reuse the media card. When a card gets full, you set it aside as an additional backup so that you can hold on to until you get home or you know you could ship it to someone back home there's a variety of things you could do of course when it comes to backing up uh, and Karen's uh, sorry Ken is asking about a monopod versus a tripod when traveling and obviously a monopod is a little bit of a compromise if you're not comfortable hand holding but you don't want to use a tripod then obviously a monopod is kind of a good in between and the key there is making sure that it collapses to a reasonably small size, but that it's also nice and rigid so that you've got a good stable platform. Obviously, your camera's still able to move a little bit with a monopod because you've just got that one leg. It's not going to balance on its own. Although, I should add, some monopods actually have little legs that pop out so that it can stand on its own. I find those tend not to be especially stable, though. So if there's any breeze at all, for example, then you will not have as steady a platform as you might otherwise assume. So I don't personally tend to use a monopod in part because either I'll shoot handheld or I would use a tripod. I kind of skip that in-between step, generally speaking. And as I mentioned, I do tend to prefer handheld photography just because I've got more flexibility. I'm able to be a little bit more nimble as I'm exploring around different subjects but naturally there are those situations where you're it's a dark situation for example or you want a long exposure and you need to make use of a tripod to get that stable platform all right well we okay not only have we run out of time we actually went over time <laughs> so sorry for uh, sticking around a little longer than expected but thank you so much for joining me thank you for sticking around for a little bit of extra time while I address those additional questions. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you joining me for today's presentation on top tips for travel photography as part of the Gray Learning webinar series. I hope you got a lot of good tips out of it. 
And let me know, by the way, send a follow-up email if there are particular topics that you'd like to see covered in future sessions, future webinar presentations as part of the Gray Learning webinar series. In the meantime, thanks very much, and I'll hope to see you again for another webinar soon.